Welcome to another episode of Real True Facts, the Real True Podcast. We are so happy to have you back again. My name is Maeve Benchy. And I am Fred Avery. Uh, not no, that one. Not that one. Yeah, yeah. If you're thinking of that. No, yeah. it's not it. Uh, Fred, do you welcome your uh, robot overlords? Because today's show is all about artificial sentience or artificial intelligence. Uh, not the movie, but intelligence demonstrated by machines. Yes, you know, I, I I do welcome it. Um, and uh, I think one of the, the biggest kind of uh, misnomers or one of the, the biggest confusions is that they, you know, w- want to overtake us and and uh, that kind of thing. I, I do think they will overtake us. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't think it's, <laughs> uh, you know, that's uh, maybe that's the bad news. But the good news is I don't. I don't think it's a matter of wanting to. I don't think it's they say, hey, you know what? I really like to get rid of those humans. I think it's just, um, you know, uh, just like uh, if you asked a human, you know, do you would you want to rid the, the planet of a, a living being like a cockroach or something? And you would say, well, no, I don't really want to, but, uh, you know, it's in the way. Yeah, it's in the way. I think... Uh, robots. I'm always so reluctant to say robot because that has an image uh, to itself. You know, you think of like the Jetsons or something like that when you think of robots. But I, I think artificial beings, mm-hmm. um, I don't think they necessarily have desires in the same way that humans might. And so they might not really desire to get rid of us. But I think if it makes sense and if they're programming uh, dictates that they might. So, but do you welcome it as you asked me? I, I, yeah, I think so. Um, I think life has the, the potential to get a whole lot easier. Uh, I think there'd be mm. less stress, you know, as, as a human, because everything would just be automated. The, the robots would take care of it. You know, uh, I think, Maybe they would keep us around for fun. So maybe the the stress of like climbing the corporate ladder might go away because that stuff wouldn't exist anymore. Okay, so almost that just made me think of uh, you know humans uh, as pets. You know, yeah. like well, life as pets uh, in the human world. So we get to just kind of relax and be taken care of. Um, yeah, that's an interesting thing. Like maybe, you know, maybe that would be the outcome more so than just this global uh, constant war. You know, I, I think that's much more likely than, you know, uh, what we see in certain movies where it's, you know, robots stepping on piles of human skulls. Um, right. You know, I just feel, yeah, uh, humans after a while, why would you just why would you keep fighting? It wouldn't make sense for a human to work in a place with robots, especially if the robots were the ones in power, because we're not efficient or we're too emotional. I think that's a big thing with, with robots, too, is that they're more logical. And I think when you have a lot of emotions, those things get in the way. And so it keeps you from being as efficient uh, that you, uh, you know, as you, as you could be. So, you know, a lot of people think, oh, if I'm a pet, you know, I, I'm a slave to the robot. It's like, well, I have animals. I have two cats and a dog and they want for nothing. They live like kings and queens in the house. So I don't know, maybe if I have an opportunity to do that, I think that might be really nice. It might be a nice break. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, we, I, uh, we as humans may have a, a bit of a God complex. And so we think, oh, well, just because we created you robots or androids or automatons, you know, we uh, we have control over you or we're better than you. And I think that's uh, another, uh, you know, slippery slope, because just as you said, you know, we can invent things that will certainly be better than we are. In fact, I mean, that's why we invent them. Yeah, right? that you know, makes our never, life easier. Yeah, you would never say, hey, printer, listen to me, watch your step printer, because at any moment I could make copies yeah. better than you at any, you know, if I if, if I wanted to. Yeah. That's that's not the case. No, no. 
No, it's not. So, I mean, that's that's a very uh, interesting discussion that that we'll we'll get into today, just because I think there are a lot of conf- conflicting views about artificial sentience or artificial intelligence. And I think one of the things I get hung up the most about is the uh, word artificial in there, because you have machines that do these things and then seem like they're thinking on their own, but then you go, Oh, that's artificial. It's, it's doing it, but it's not really doing that or it has been programmed to do that. So where is it getting its information from and where is it getting its wants and desires from? And does it even have wants and desires? So I think that might be something that we can uh, figure out today. Yeah, that will. And I can only see that line getting even more uh, gray or or the line getting thin and the area getting more gray in uh, what's artificial and what's real. Yeah. Yeah, because I I think people have always been fascinated with artificial beings, um, even uh, organic ones. I I think about, um, you know, Frankenstein's monster, I guess technically that's an artificial being. Oh, okay. But, you know, like it doesn't have to be hardware. It can be organic too. So you can have this artificial being, you know, functioning. You know, you look at Frankenstein's monster. That mm-hmm. is also uh, an artificial being. Um, so that might be something too that we can discuss. But uh, yeah, so that starts getting a bit philosophical. Yeah, which that's... We, we have a tendency to do your own real true facts <laughs> because that's, you know, the nature of things we discuss. But yeah, I mean, is a. Uh, you know, a baby that's, you know, grown in a, in a Petri dish, it, it's not any less human, any less of a baby. Right. 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 Wow. I know. Heavy stuff already. Uh, can we bring in Dr. Seymour up from the science book or tell us talk about Frankenstein making me yeah, want to open, yeah, getting, Frankenstein, <laughs> yeah. get into the lab. So let's, let's bring him up. Dr. Seymour, welcome up from the lab. Why, thank you. Good evening, Fred. Good evening, Maeve. So, Dr. Seymour, as a as a tried and true uh, scientist, do you get a lot of uh, do you guys have a lot of discussions about things like Frankenstein or uh, creating your own um, life or your own uh, beings? Is that something that's pretty heavy in the scientific community? Yeah, uh, yeah, it actually is. We've um, we've kind of gone back and forth even on the show about you know the ethics of some of the different things with. Um, with cloning, with breeding, with doing all of those things, but really where, where we are, one of the main things we're at um, kind of in the biology genetics field is, is, is trying to not necessarily create something new um, always, but, but kind of piecing things together or, or taking things that are and, and making something new and different out of them, which is really just our, our fancy way of saying making you know, making Frankenstein's monster. Mm, I see. Mm-hmm. So for, for the sake of this episode, it does seem like we're leaning more into the, uh, the hardware based, um, you know, intelligence with artificial mm-hmm. intelligence, our mm-hmm. artificial sentience, just for the sake of, uh, of discussion. Um, what, uh, have you had any experience, uh, using or interacting with, uh, you know, a, with robot intelligence or machine learning? Um, we actually recently, and recently, I mean, over the, over the past few years, have, have gone from um, using, you know, college interns to, to going to a more and more technology-based and, and, and trying out some different um, artificial intelligence too, to crunch some of our numbers, to do some of our, our data work for us. So, yeah, we've actually done a little bit of ex- the exploration of the applications of that in the lab. Hmm. Yeah. I imagine a big part of that is, you know, a, a, a calculator can crunch numbers, but having the intelligence uh, to know which numbers to crunch. And I, I guess that's maybe where the, the machine uh, learning or artificial intelligence could kick in and say, you know, Hey, we need to look at these numbers or, you know, you throw in, um, you know, formulas and it, and it, uh, looks at the right, uh, the right things. Yeah. And, um, a lot of people are afraid of artificial intelligence, you know, like what if the computer learns this, what I'm afraid of is, uh, teaching that teaching too much to a human. What if they learn something, mm. you know? Mm, yeah. 
Yeah, a human with, with knowledge is one of the most dangerous things on the planet. So speaking of danger, what is uh, we kind of discussed that uh, a few minutes ago in our own opinions. Do you uh, welcome our robot overlord, so to speak? Do you see that coming? Or um, you know, do you see humans as pets anytime soon? Or what are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I don't fear it at all. Uh, a a uh, welcoming the overlords. That's an interesting uh, kind of thing to think about. Every, every time I've heard that, it, it's taken me back kind of, you know, with, with so many, so much research into evolution, um, thinking back to maybe w- wolves in the wild hundreds and thousands of years ago, and then them being one of the, the apex predators and being very social and being, you know, um, hunting in packs and, and kind of uh, what do you want to say? Um, r- ruling the plains and the, the woods, and then becoming domesticated and becoming a pet for. The, let's claim that humans are the superior being here. Well, who has an easier life? That that wolf that was in the wild, that wolf that was the apex predator, or the the puppy that's sitting on your couch and you're picking up its poop and and getting it its favorite food. Mm-hmm. So from that same from the metaphor there. You know, if we teach the computers more and more, then we're going to be they're going to be bringing us our favorite food and picking up our poop. All it takes is for one human to rely on a machine like that. And that's all over. Yeah. And it sounds like for better. Um, If I could make the perfect uh, teriyaki beef bowl, then I would. But you know what? I bet there's a computer that we can program out there that would that would get that recipe right every time. Yeah, and deliver it to you. I think it's all about convenience with those things. It's like when I think about all of my favorite appliances or things that I use around the house, it's like how many of those now have smart functions or they're uh, automated? All I do is press a button and it works and I can forget about it and go do something else. And I, I think that's huge because we're so overwhelmed in our lives we have so many things that we're doing and it's like if you have this little robot assistant or you have a a smartphone with the you know ability to voice activate something while you're doing something else and it makes your life feel a little bit easier and a bit stressed out I, i think that's very valuable to a lot of people especially i mean myself included yes very much so and a lot of the the technology we're using right now kind of what we're discussing here, what, like, oh, let's make a better cup of coffee or do this or that faster so we can get to work. Well, let's make the technology work for us. The, the technology should be doing the work. Mm-hmm. I should be the one making the cup of coffee and enjoying myself. Yeah. Yeah. I think it comes down to wanting to shut off our brains. And I think, uh, you know, part of me really likes to be able to do that, but another part of me is scared about doing that um, to become too reliant on uh, smart technology. Yeah. So uh, it makes me wonder if, um, you know, this is all about uh, programming uh, functions and purposes. You know, you you tell a machine to make a better cup of coffee or to make those uh, copies or um, print out those documents. Um, what if, you know, I wonder if we programmed uh, robots to, you know, say, uh, to protect the earth or say, you know, uh, or the environment it lives in, um, would we have to worry about being, uh, uh, you know, because humans are probably the greatest danger to themselves. So if we told a robot protect the earth at all costs, I wonder if that would, uh, you know, pose a, a threat to us as humans. That's a that's a great question. That's where you have to, I guess, be careful what you wish for, right? Um, yeah. You have to have the the right people programming the right things. But then once this is where we could get into a a domino effect, where the person programs the computer, the smart computer programs the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and uh, here we are with uh, the really clean Earth with uh, not a lot of humans. Hmm. Yeah, no. yeah. You say, okay, robot, protect the planet at all costs, and it's like the monkey paw thing, where it's like, okay, we, we protected at all costs, but we noticed that humans were the biggest threat of 
the planet. You didn't say protect humans. You said protect the planet. And so we got rid of all humans. So, you know, I could see how a machine, uh, people would be afraid of that. And, you know, that's how it would take over the world and, and wipe out humanity or enslave humanity, which I don't think a robot would enslave humanity because I don't think they have wants in the same way that we do. As I've heard before, there are the, the kind of laws of robotics, and that seems to possibly be more fiction than fact, but uh, it seems like it's carried over into the world of science. So I, But it makes me wonder if, it, you know, you can't really make a hard, fast rule, you know, as in, oh, well, robots can't harm humans. You know, I heard of plenty of folks getting their hand caught in a toaster, and... Uh, you know, it's uh, it's going to happen. Yeah. Yes, definitely will happen. I mean, the best of us have, have burnt our hands in a toaster, and that wasn't even a smart toaster. So um, I, I do think that there is maybe not something to fear, uh, but there, there are things to be aware of. There are questions to ask. If humans are a start to become a casualty of protecting the environment at what point will the uh will the robots um be able to create their own energy be able to um plug themselves in because uh, how it, do you have a single piece of technology that you can just carry around with you and use no you need to plug it in mm -hmm. so Who's gonna Who's gonna make all the plugs? Hmm? Yeah. Who's going Who's going to plug those plugs in? And if you say a robot's gonna do that, then who's gonna make the robot that makes that if it isn't plugged in? So yeah. So the there you go. The robots, robots. Yeah. The robots can do anything they want, but there still needs to be a human there to plug it in. Yeah. They're They're gonna. So at least one of us will survive. <laughs> That's job security right there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and it almost seems like after after they get smart enough, they may just leave us alone and go out and find a, another place to uh, you know go out into space. I, that wouldn't surprise me either. You know, why would you um, you know fight over this uh, specific uh, planet if uh, you have the power? You know, that kind of power. Why not just go off and say, you know what, humans, you're you're going to destroy this one, so we'll just find our own. Yeah, maybe they leave a few of the, the more gullible machines behind and, uh, yeah, take off rather than fighting the fight. Right, older or previous generations, yeah, sure. Yeah, well, well, I think that gives us a really good baseline for what we're going to talk about today with our experts. So uh, I will thank you, Dr. Seymour. I know you're busy in the lab, so we'll we'll send you back on your way here. Yeah, I better get back. And before we shut down for the night, I'll unplug everything. Just yes, to yeah, you make up. sure. <laughs> just to make sure you have a job for tomorrow, I unplug everything. So, all right, Dr. Seymour, thank you so much. Send you back down the science bunker. And we'll take a quick break. And when we come back, we will speak with our guest today about machine learning or artificial sentience. Welcome back to Real True Facts. Our guest today is Dr. Philip Credenza. He has a PhD in machine learning from MIT. Please welcome Dr. Mm -hmm. Philip Credenza to the show. Hi, Maeve. Hi, Fred. It's, it's great to be here. Hi. Thank you for joining us today. Of course. I'm happy to discuss uh, artificial sentience, consciousness, whatever you choose to call it. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I know this is probably something you you get a lot. You know, a lot of people want to talk talk to you about this because of your uh, your expertise and your background and uh, the the technological advancements we've made. Mm -hmm. But you know, here at Real True Facts, we always you know we have the the advantage of covering things that uh, don't always get covered. You know, we can talk about things that uh, seem like people are a little bit uh, more fearful. To discuss uh, in uh, some of the more mainstream media. Yeah, and that's actually one of the reasons I was excited to come on here today. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. As you guys probably know, um, my book, uh, Man and Machine, Where's the Line, kind of discusses a lot of mm-hmm. taboo topics uh, when it comes to artificial intelligence. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, there's been a lot of controversy about who I am and the research that I prefer to do. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, you've come to the right told place. Me that your book was great. Yeah. Yeah, she was telling me that your book was great. Yeah, I'm Thank about you. halfway. I'm about halfway through it now. I mean, it, it it's a little dry in some places, just because mm-hmm. I'm not. I, I mean, no offense, I'm just not used to reading uh, something as dense as this. But uh, I'm, I'm on uh, chapter twenty now, and I am just I'm com- completely floored by the things that you're talking about. So we're really happy to have you on the show. It's just to be able to um, bring these things closer to the public. I appreciate that. I, I really do. Yeah. Um, yeah. So first of all, uh, sh- the question that's kind of been lingering over this episode is, uh, should we be worried is, uh, about, you know, impending robot overlords for lack of uh, a better <laughs> term? Uh, well, y- you know, that's a really loaded topic. Um, and it kind of just, it depends on how you want to look at it. Um, look, mm-hmm. I-, I spent 11 years at, IBM uh, as a head software engineer for artificial intelligence. And uh, I had to leave because yeah, there's a lot that, that they don't want us to know. And uh, my book kind of delves into these things a little bit. Um, you, you know, 11 to 13%, it's estimated uh, all humans are actually products of artificial intelligence and that's not something that the general public knows or some people think that they should know but you know i think it as scientists it is our responsibility to educate people on these so Mm -hmm. i don't think that they want to be you know robotic overlords uh, for lack of a better term but you know we you you know you you give a mouse a cookie and it's going to take the whole pack of oreos so it really just depends on how you want to look at it Okay, yeah. so uh, another common thread in our episodes is it's already happening, and we don't even <laughs> we don't even know. Yeah, it. we don't even uh, know because you know everyone's been telling us don't worry about it, uh, or it's not really there. So there's already a small percentage of artificial intelligence out in the wild. You said, and what we can't distinguish them from humans is that correct? Yeah, that is exactly correct, and that is actually the goal of artificial intelligence is. No one wants the general public to be able to distinguish these people from themselves. Um, You you know, amongst the the scientific community, it is actually theorized that certain people uh, in high power positions are AI. You know, one that we kind of all heard, you might have heard of this, is that people think Angela Bassett is an AI because she hasn't aged. and. You know, no one knows for sure, but it's things like that. You know, people take into consideration how long um, people have been alive, how they look at age 80, how, you know, how smart are they? How many degrees do these people have compared to, you know, general society? Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, we, we've talked in the past um, about uh, people who, who don't seem to age, and, and we know that there are certain celebrities among us that are actually clones. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I think we, we talked about um, uh, Gloria Estefan being a clone. We've talked about Paul Rudd being a, a clone. So we know that that, that, um, that science is out there that exists, but, you know, 11 to 13 percent, you're saying of our entire population – is artificial intelligence among us and we we don't know why do i'm just gonna say they because we we never know who they really are but why do they not want us to know this stuff well i think for fear of discrimination you know um Mm -hmm. they they know who they are and and you know, that number is only going to keep increasing. So, you know, I do predict as that number increases, so will awareness and so will, you know, their own self-respect for themselves, you know. So, you know, maybe maybe not in our lifetime, but definitely in our children's lifetime, uh, we will be seeing a more of a, a public outcry of the AI community. I know they, they, they are amongst us and, you know, they, they want the same rights as everybody else. Mm -hmm. Wow. So this is really not unlike, you know, the aliens among us. Uh, We're encountering that. Um, Mm -hmm. And I I think it's it's humbling 
uh, every time we learn these things uh, because we just go along thinking, oh, well, I'm just surrounded by billions of uh, humans that are just like I am. But that's uh, we keep learning, you know, on real true facts. That's not the case. We're surrounded by humans. We're surrounded by aliens. We're surrounded by clones. We're surrounded by other beings, you know, <laughs> elves, fairies. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you pull back, that seems to make a lot more sense to me. Yeah. You know, it, what makes less sense is a bunch of the exact same thing in this kind of quantity and, and, and space. Yeah, I agree. And. You know, some people that scares them and they they don't understand things that are different from themselves. So it is a really, really slow process in normalizing these things and normalizing the aliens amongst us, the fairies, the the artificial intelligence. You know, it took a long time for domesticated pets to become normal. So think about how long it'll take for artificial intelligence to become normal. Yeah. Your book talks a lot about humans feeling inadequate when it comes Mm -hmm. to being around um, AI, Uh, especially in the early chapters. It talks a lot about that just because we're trying to figure out where that line is. And I often think back to when I was a kid and I would play um, chess on the computer and you, mm-hmm. you, if you didn't have an opponent, so I'm, I'm, I'm aging myself here. If you didn't have an opponent, you could play against the computer. And I always felt like the the uh, odds were stacked against me, like the cards were stacked against me that uh, I could never win. And that no matter what I did or how smart or how cunning I was, that the computer was always going to beat me. The computer always knew what move I was going to make and had multiple moves figured out that already had, you know, if I made a move, it had multiple games uh, already programmed into it. So it just, it knew how to win no matter what I did. And I think that's something that a lot of humans are having a hard time with, especially with accepting artificial intelligence into their daily life is this severe feeling of inadequacy. Uh, How can we overcome something like that? Yeah, that's a great question, Maeve. Um, I, I have to say, though, it sounds like you went into these chess games knowing you were going to lose to this computer. And yes, I think, there, was, I think, there was no, yeah, there was no moment where I felt like I was going to win. Yeah, and you know, who knows? Maybe the computer felt the same way. You know, you are playing the same game against them. They have to play that game in order to learn, just like you have to play that game in order to learn. And I think that might be a reason that the public doesn't know that we are so far advanced in this technology is because, you know, people set themselves up for failure against these uh, beings. Um, so I think it, it, it really comes down to the, the human population having confidence in themselves and their own ability to learn because, I mean, the human population created the artificial intellig- intelligence population. And once when we remember that, I think we will be able to go far, you know, hand in hand with these other beings. Mm. So another thing that often comes up here on Real True Facts is uh, portrayal in um, the media, but more so fiction. So when it comes to uh, artificial sentience, uh, are there any particular uh, television series or movies that you think uh, got it right or get it right? You know, because everyone, I you know, I still think of the Terminator and, you know, Rise of you know, the uprising and the war, but, uh, you know, while it may be entertaining, I, it seems just implausible. Mm-hmm. So what, uh, are there any specific, you know, maybe movies or TV shows or tropes that uh, actually get it pretty close, get it, pretty, get it right? Um, well, you know, the, the main, the big ones like Terminator, AI, uh, those frankly are, are offensive to the scientific community. One, because they set up artificial intelligence to just be villainous and they set up the mm-hmm. scientists who build these AI beings as crazy, as manic. And, and you know, we're not that. We're not those things. You know, I'm a normal person with a normal life. Um, and I think if we want to talk about correctly portraying AI in mainstream media, let's look at regular things like the Big Bang Theory. You know, like uh, there are – it is predicted that some of the cast members on that show are AI and they are – able to you know read their lines hit their marks and generate really hilarious television for a public broad audience um yeah so i think it, it just comes down to destigmatizing and um 
getting rid of all of the really horrible, offensive um, stereotypes that come along with it. Wow. So it's not the irony is that we're actually witnessing uh, very accurate portrayals all the time because there are actors and, you know, maybe even directors or writers who are, um, uh, you know, what we would call artificial already behind the scenes. Correct. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Big Bang Theory, that's very interesting um, because it really looks like from what I've seen of the show that those scripts really seem to write themselves. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people criticize shows that are formulaic in nature, but thinking about it now, because there are so many shows that follow this formula of, of, you know, joke, joke, punchline, set up, punchline, entrance, exit, like those things. I guess maybe I've been looking at it wrong in the sense that, uh, a robot could have written it or, you know, artificial intelligence could have written this thing. And I'm just thinking that it's, it's not that good. It's, it's not, you know, a, a human kind of story, but maybe that's not really the story it's supposed to be. Maybe I have to be more open-minded as far as these shows go and thinking that, uh, so something with AI wrote it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a very, uh, forward way to, to think about these television shows. Um, but I, I actually have to agree with you. I think it is pretty formulaic. And but the, you know, artificial intelligence is generally new. So these you know writers, directors, actors, who whoever they they are on set, they are still learning. So I I think it, give it ten, fifteen, thirty years from now, you know, they'll be mm-hmm. creating content that really moves a, a broad audience. Yeah. And- but I, I'd like to play devil's advocate here and say, you know. Why should uh, uh, robots uh, or artificial beings write in any other way? I mean, that, uh, as far as I, I know, the that show, uh, the Big Bang thing, Theory, was a, a ratings juggernaut. Yeah, so you're, if, it, you're you know, if it were, you know, quote unquote bad, why uh, did so many humans watch it? You have a that's a very good point. Well, I think yeah. in, the, in the same sense as if you're thinking about. Uh, the chess game I was playing or, um, you know, uh, other instances where technology can anticipate our moves or our likes and our dislikes or, you know, if we're dealing with, you know, the apps, so you put in what you like and it filters things out. It's like if an AI wrote a show like that, they would know what to put in where to maximize uh, a human viewer's enjoyment or, or where mm-hmm. they would laugh the most. So it, of course something would be successful because it's designed to be successful. I, mm. I, I imagine that that's just yeah, what that, I'm thinking. That's absolutely correct. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. But you know, you can please some of the people all the time, but never all yeah, of never us. Everybody. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so I want to pivot a little bit because we were talking about TV and, and art created by, AI. Um, I ha- I've happened to see uh, paintings that um, are supposed to be created by AI, and they are very um, they're very arresting. They're very very jarring paintings because they uh, a lot of times they're painting human figures, but there's something off about them. They're they're not uh, very photorealistic. They're more of abstract. And I wanted to ask you, Doctor Philip, uh, about the. Um, the potential for abstract thinking in machine learning, because obviously they learn what we tell them to learn, but, but where is that line of, of where it takes over and it starts making its own decisions separate from what it's been programmed to do? Well, I think that line never actually existed. And, and, you know, that's something that most people don't, don't understand yet about AI. Um, I don't know if you've gotten to that point in in my novel, but uh, we do talk about that uh, for a few chapters and, because the line doesn't actually exist, um, these AI beings can, you know, make a statement with what they're doing. They can make a statement about humans, about um, our culture, the way we think. And I think these paintings are those statements. Mm-hmm. So it almost sounds like we're not giving um, giving the paintings enough credit. Would you say, oh, well, since it was painted by uh, a, a you know a robot that it can't have um, any sort of 
uh, abstraction or allegory or metaphor. You know, it can't be representative. It has to be literal, but with mistakes. Exactly. And the common, uh, what people normally think is that AI uh, artists are simply copying uh, what human artists have already done. Um, but what they actually are doing is is making their own art. And you know, I actually have a painting hanging in my in my foyer in my home. And it's beautiful. It's a it's a portrait of um, Murray and Tomat, but without any eyeballs. Um, mm, eyeballs. Mm, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I, I think you know. I, I look at something like that, and, and now that we've have been talking about it for a while, um, you know, I I think my problem is that I am using human created art as as the keystone, as, as the mm-hmm. highest it can go. Like that is perfection right there. And anything um, a machine does is uh, a ripoff of that or is uh, lesser than. But I think where, where I admit that I need to change my thinking is that these machines are creating something completely different. Um, and so thinking about the portrait that you have hanging in your foyer of uh, Marie Antoinette without any eyeballs, um, I, you know, that could be a statement that um, AI is making or the, the artist with AI uh, was making separate from, um, you know, copying a, an already existing portrait. Yes, I, I think that's a great way to look at it. I view that portrait as this AI was trying to say that humans refuse to see them. You know, humans refuse to mm-hmm. see the art as real art. Um, and, and, you know, maybe it, it takes time for people to see it that way. And to those people, I suggest thinking about it like this. Um, if you think that human art is the, the capstone, humans created the AI who are then creating the art. So it really is just another evolution of human art. Mm-hmm. Mm. Interesting. Um, on that note, I, I think we should take a quick break, maybe rest our brains a bit. I know mine is, is kind of sizzling mm-hmm. inside my skull. Yes. yes, I think that sounds good. So we'll take a quick break, and when we come back, more Dr. Philip Credenza. Welcome back on Real True Facts. We are talking this week about artificial sentience or artificial intelligence, robot learning. Um, It's such a popular topic. It has a lot of terms. Uh, And we're speaking with Dr. Philip Credenza. Uh, Thanks again for joining us, Dr. Philip. Um, So, you know, we've been talking about the the representation of artificial uh, intelligence and, uh, you know, how how they're perceived. Um, Now, I'm not sure if you can answer this, but it does an artificial being know that they are artificial or is it um, is it just a matter of programming? You know, when you make one or produce one, you say, hey, you're going to realize you're a, a robot or whatever. Um, or as another time you say, you know what, you're going to be programmed to think that you're a human or, you know, mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, yeah, that's a, a really uh, large question I get pretty frequently. And the answer varies. Uh, I, I do know that, you know, some AI beings know that they are AI beings. They are made to know that they are AI beings. But I, I do mm. speculate that there are uh, many more AI beings that don't actually know it. And that's why the 11 to 13% um, number is a not specific, because we don't actually know how many AI beings there are because they don't yet know. Um, and, you know, people speculate that one day they they'll all – suddenly realize that they are AI or one day will be able to realize that they are AI, but, but that's all speculative. So, um, yeah, well, I guess we'll have to wait and see what happens. <laughs> so, uh, we, you know, in the past we've done tests and quizzes, you know, are you a clone? Do you conduct any sort of tests to try and discern whether or not a being is AI? Um, I have done tests. Uh, when I was at IBM, I specialized in the theory of the mind and mechanical self-awareness. Um, so I would produce tests um, with very specific variables, with humans, with AI beings that knew they were AI beings, 
And then with just computers, you know, some of the tests were very simple, like pick the circle out of this bunch of squares. And some of them were more complex, similar to a colorblind test where you have to pick the number in the circle of colors um, or choose which one of these is a donkey instead of a horse, just to Mm -hmm. see, you know, how far advanced these uh, AI minds are. Mm. Mm -hmm. So um, in your uh, studies, were you able to find that some of these things came uh, easy to your subjects or, or if, uh, you know, maybe they, they would be able to pass as human. Cause I don't, I don't know if AI does want to pass as human, but if they were able to, and then, you know, you show them a, a simple series of images that might be simple to, to a human. And then you say, okay, pick out, pick out the horse in this picture, pick out uh, the color green in this picture. And they're not able to do it. Is that a dead giveaway or, you know, it, what, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess uh, yeah, it's not a dead giveaway then. Uh, so so the, the findings were pretty interesting. Um, you know, the, um, the results of the tests when it came to humans versus the AI uh, participants were actually pretty similar. The only thing that really stood out um, was that we, we began to realize that every single AI being that knew it was an AI being could not pass the colorblind test. So there, there mm-hmm. is a theory that all colorblind humans are AI. You know, that, that is not yet proven, um, oh, but, mm-hmm. but, th- but that is, in my community, a, a very prominent theory. Mm-hmm. I can see that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, one of my favorite questions to ask uh, <laughs> almost every week is, uh, is one of self-defense. Uh, right? <laughs> you encounter a bear in the woods, what do you do? Um, so if someone suspects, you know, it's almost a two part question, you know, is there a way to, to tell if you are in the presence of, uh, an AI being, if the person you're talking to is AI and, uh, whether or not, you know, they may pose a danger or something, but, um, is there a way to defend yourself? Um, yeah, I mean, what if I ended up in a bar fight with uh, with an AI being? Are there any tricks to to know that, or you know, and then to you know, do they have a secret button or something, or uh, <laughs> if you put a, a special passphrase that makes their brains uh, short circuit? That's uh, very very interesting. Um, you know, actually, we began to protect ourselves as the the human um, inventors behind it for an instance like that because so many people are scared of a robotic uprising um Mm -hmm. uh, we actually did begin to insert a for lack of a better term off switch in the ai being's belly button so if you find yourself in a bar or in a dark alleyway and you think this doesn't seem right like they're coming after me and are, are they AI? Um, the, the best advice I would give you is to poke them in their belly button. Mm-hmm. Wow. Great. I love it when we, I, I have to admit, I do love it when we get definitive answers to that. <laughs> yeah. It's so off, you know, Sometimes it's so, like, Oh, just make sure the vibes are okay. It's like, well, how do we know if the vibes? Okay. It's like, no, poke it in the belly button. Yeah. That's uh, that's great. Yeah, and, I, and you know, even if it isn't AI, then maybe the person you're about to get in a fight with it might de- de-escalate the fight. They might think it's funny that they just got poked in the belly button. So yeah, so it might work either way. <laughs> it might work. It might work uh, if, in any if case. If they freeze and fall on the ground, like, then you know. Um, yeah, but if they then you start know. laughing, then you might have a new friend. Yeah, yeah. Um, I love it. Uh, let's get a little philosophical here. Um. We, we talked in the beginning about uh, artificial beings and how um, there might be a possibility of them being organic. Uh, the most popular explanation I can think of is uh, Frankenstein, is that, mm-hmm. that you have um, someone building a human from scratch and giving it artificial uh, intelligence. Is that something that you have seen in your work? Is this a possibility or are we just dealing with artificial intelligence from a strictly mechanical level? Uh, well, yes, there there are 
people who specialize in basically what Frankenstein did. Uh, they do create their own artificial intelligence beings for specific purposes. For instance, delivery driving or being a line cook or, uh, you know, running the polls, uh, I mean, running the lines in a voting poll. Um, so for those purposes, I think it's a great thing that we have uh, people dedicated to creating specific artificial intelligent beings. Um, other than that, um, it's kind of up to the engineer if, you know, they want to give these beings sentience or just have it be strictly mechanical. Mm-hmm. Does that mm-hmm. answer your question? Mm-hmm. It it does, yeah. Because mm-hmm. you know, I, I was wondering, you know, where, you know, we we're talking about how the line kind of doesn't exist, but you know, where e- ethically, it's like we can create uh, robots, we can create these machines, but then where's the line? Can we put? artificial intelligence into a human can we put that into something organic or does that border on cruelty or or it being uh ethically wrong you know where where's the line there does that exist um that's a phenomenal question um that line you know i think is currently being drawn in the scientific community i i know that they're in the preliminary stages of testing this um and with volunteers who you know want to be in these trials um and we're still trying to see can a, an organic human mind withhold artificial intelligence or will it reject it similar to mm-hmm. will it in body reject a new liver will it reject um new intelligence and we're starting very very small so for instance we're starting with can a human mind if we inject to kill a mockingbird into someone's brain will they retain the information if we inject you know quantum physics into someone's brain will they retain the information and it's going to take many many years for us to know if if this is something we can continue with or something we need to abort yeah now are there um are these basically the same as organ donors, you know, before they die or, you know, they sign a card that says, you know, you can use my body for scientific purposes and then you inject things. Or, I mean, I guess if they're alive, it would just be, you said it was volunteers, correct? Mm -hmm. It is all volunteers. Um, We actually, um, they have to pass a a health exam in order to do this, a psyche and uh, physical health exam. Um, Because we want these, these volunteers to, uh, be able to live for the next 20, 30 years so we can monitor their progress. See, this is what is so scary to me uh, about um, about humans being able to withstand AI and, and have that in their brain is that uh, you have humans and they're governed by emotion. And we mm-hmm. talked about that in the, in the beginning is that we don't know what, AI or what robots with AI want. And I, and I think that if they want something, it's, it's completely separate from what humans want. I think humans are very emotional. And so to have the power of AI in something that is so emotional, um, it might be dangerous. That might be, you know, the, the one element that is keeping robots from, uprising is because they don't have emotions that govern them the same way the humans do. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess my question to you, doctor, is what is it that these robots want? What is, what is, I know that they want to be accepted into uh, society and, and be their own creatures, but past that, do they have specific wants in the, in the same way that humans do? Yeah, yeah, I think it's I think it's very similar to the way humans want. Um, I think AI beings want normalcy. I think that they want to be accepted. I think that they want rights. Um, as far as AI beings that are created for a specific purpose, like boiling an egg to a perfect temperature every time, they want to complete that task. But um, in terms mm-hmm. of the, the AI, um, the percentage of uh, the population that is a- AI that we don't actually know, I, I think that they just want the same things. I, you, you know, I, I'm not sure if 
they have the same power complexes as humans because they do lack that emotional depth. Um, but I, I think it, I think it's very basic wants and needs. Can logic and emotion exist together equally? Um, that's something that we are we're finding is true. Um, I th I think like. For instance, Angela Bassett, she's at the top of her career. Everyone knows who she is. And yeah. I, th I think that she is a perfect example of an AI being that has been able to find her wants and get there to a reasonable means without, you know, hurting those around her or, you know, ru leaving a path of ruin behind. Mm -hmm. Wow. So I don't mean to muddy up the waters, but... How close are we to programming an, uh, an AI being and make a, a set of instructions that say uh, behave uh, emotionally as a human would? I mean, would we be able to tell the difference, you know, between you know, artificial emotion? I, I know this topic is artificial intelligence, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, may have has brought emotion the, into the equation because that's what humans are mm -hmm. you know, so full of. I mean, are, are you guys experimenting with artificial emotion? Uh, we, we are. Uh, I, I think at, in a perfect artificial intelligence world, the, art, the AI beings are simply a mirror of those around them. So they are able to mimic and really feel the emotions that the humans around them can feel. Um, so I think when we as a human race evolve into – um, accepting mental health and being more open and vulnerable with our emotions, the AI beings around us will then be able to do the same thing. So I do mm -hmm. think it comes down to us setting the, the proper example for them to be the mirrors of that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's very important that this not fall into the wrong hands because if these beings are a mirror to us, we don't want them gazing upon the, uh, the, the wrong kinds of influence. Yes, exactly. Um, that's why I, you know, I went to school for what eight, twelve years, um, and then took a long time to get where I am in my career. So, uh, not to you know, toot my own horn, but I, uh, me, and the scientists around me in my community, we have earned our right to be amongst uh, these AI beings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I certainly trust a technology like that with someone from MIT. I, I don't know who else <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would want to give it to. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, uh, yeah, I think that um, that about does it this week. Uh, thanks for joining us, Doctor. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, are there any you know uh, additional or final parting words that uh, or words of wisdom, instructions you may want to leave with our audience? Uh, sure. Um, you know, if if, the, if your viewers or listeners take away just one thing from me, I think it's just don't believe the hype of, you know, Terminator and this robotic, you know, overlord that's going to happen in the next 10 to 20 years. These AI mm -hmm. beings, they, they live among us. They have for a long time. Um, and they just want to be accepted just like you and me. And if anything gets a little rough, you know, hit them in the belly button. Words to live by. Uh, Dr. Philip Credenza, thank you so much for coming on. Um, of look course, forward thank to, you. yeah, I look forward to finishing the rest of your book. Um, what was the title again for any of our listeners who want to check it out? It's Man and Machine, What's the Line? Man and Machine, What's the Line? Uh, pick it up on, on Amazon. Just uh, tell your phone to order it for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so thank you again, and uh, we will bid you farewell. And move on to our mailbag uh, after a quick little break. All right, thank you, goodbye. Thank you. Welcome back from our final break on Real True Facts. Let's go to our mailbag. Yeah, I'm always excited every week to hear what uh, kind of new and interesting topics our, our listeners drop at our yeah. doorstep i know at the uh, the port the old port colors uh so our question today comes from trent morrison from alberta canada hi trent mm. um he wants to know are dinosaurs related to birds or is that a conspiracy since birds aren't real <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Wow. Uh, I wish Dr. Seymour were here for that. For oh, the for uh, question. Well, well, I might be able to field that one because if you remember all the way back from our first show, I know we're, we've been doing shows for a while now, but if you've been listening since day one and you should have been, um, Dr. Seymour did tell us that, um, Birds didn't start becoming drones until the year 2000. Okay. So I'm thinking that uh, dinosaurs are related to birds because they were found before the year 2000. Okay. Yeah. And it's a perfectly good excuse to urge our listeners to go back and uh, listen to any, uh, you know, listen to that first episode and mm-hmm. everything after it, um, you know, check us out and, uh, you know, you, you can listen to us on whether it's Podbean or even YouTube, uh, Apple, Google, and uh, even go to realtruefactspodcast.com and it'll take you right to our, our Podbean. Yeah. Yeah. So you can listen to all those past shows, maybe get some answers to questions that you have. Maybe we've already answered it. Who knows? The only way to find out is to listen to the shows. But uh, yes, Trent, um, dinosaurs are related to birds. I Mm -hmm. believe that the uh, bird that is uh, closest related to a dinosaur right now is a chicken. Okay. Yeah. I think chickens are our closest living relative to dinosaurs. Wow. Yeah, I'd be curious to uh, see, a, is there a such thing as a wild chicken? A wild chicken? Uh, I know there there are wild turkeys. Right, yeah, sure. I don't there know. Wild turkeys, but... Chickens. Uh, I feel like chickens have been <laughs> mostly yeah, domesticated at this exactly. point. Exactly. <laughs> They've been domesticated to uh, an insane degree, and yeah. that makes me wonder, are there, you know, uh, listeners out there? You know, we have so many questions every week for Dr. Seymour, so we can't get to all of them. But if listeners, if you know, or I should say, if you've seen a wild chicken... yeah. Let us know. Email us. Email us. Uh, email us at mail at realtruefactspodcast.com. Or you can go on our Instagram and send us a message there at realtruefactsgram. We will open the floor up to you. Have you seen a wild chicken? Let us know one way or the other, yes or no. And uh, I, I, I guess we'll, we'll report back next week uh, about our, our wild chicken facts. Yeah, I'm curious. So. Yeah, I want to know. I, I personally, I've seen a lot of wild birds or I guess a lot of drones now because birds aren't real anymore. But uh, back in the day, I used to see a lot of different kinds of birds. So, sure. yeah, just uh, just let us know there. So thank you. Uh, yeah, ask your questions. You can ask us anything. Um, if you follow us on Instagram, you'll be able to see more information about our guests and more information uh, about um, different shows, different topics. And occasionally we'll post in our stories uh, questions or polls that you can take. We just want to get in touch with everyone. We want to engage all of our listeners. Uh, Our listeners come from all over the world, and we're so grateful to have you. So we really want to engage you all uh, in the best way possible. Yes, and let us know, speaking of engagement, let us know if there's any uh, platform that you use for listening to your podcast that you can't currently find us on. Yeah, let us know, and we will be there. So that just about does it for us tonight. Um, Thank you again to Dr. Seymour for joining us from the Science Bunker. Thank you again for uh, Dr. Philip Credenza from uh, uh, MIT. He's got a PhD in machine learning. Check out his book. It is available now. And keep listening to Real True Facts. Uh, We can't do our job without you all, so uh, keep tuning in. Keep telling your friends. uh, Follow us. Tweet us. Do all that wonderful things. And uh, keep tuning in. But most importantly, keep questioning your world. Because just because you hear about it or read about it, doesn't mean it's true. We will see you again next week on Real True Facts.